<laughs> that's true. I could. I don't think anybody ever watches these things, anyways. God help me if they ever did. But um, all right. So I, I guess we'll get started. So this week is our authentication. Um, did we build the flash system last week with the messaging? I don't think it was working. Yeah. Uh, it was working mostly. It was not working on certain pages. Yeah, I think with update it wasn't really working, and that was mostly due to the way update works. Because, no, what, what it was is if you got an error in new, it would send you back, but it sent you to the wrong page. Because it, it interpreted the fact that you had a blog, meaning you were updating now. So that broke it. But that's fine. We'll fix that later on. We'll fix that in post. But uh, as long as we've done that part, though, we definitely have sessions, which means we don't need to go through the whole hassle of setting up sessions and everything else. Thursday, unfortunately, didn't get to this part, so they will have to do the flash part. So that'll hold us back. All of our views today, we're going to copy and paste just so we can bullet through a little quicker um, because the focus really isn't about the views. It's more about the actual authentication process and how that application flow works. Now, I said we weren't going to use Passport, which is a... Um, it's an authentication strategy that is already available. It's quite common in the industry to use Passport uh, because it actually rolls multiple strategies into it. So instead of just um, like Google, or sorry, just basic authentication with email and password, it also has like Google authentication, Twitter, Facebook, all of those guys, plus API authentication strategies and everything else. But it's like, it's a massive sledgehammer, right, of things. And it's very difficult to use because there is a ton of configuration you have to do in order to get it to work. Um, that being said, after spending the weekend actually implementing bcrypt into this, there is more code involved in this scenario than if we had to just use Passport. But you will understand how password authentication works at a very granular level by the end of this class, which is kind of cool because that will help you in the future if you ever decide to roll your own password in. Um, strategy. And that being said, you might be like, well, why would I ever actually roll my own password strategy? Because at the end of the day, things like Passport or if you're using um, like PHP's uh, authentication module, auth module, or if you're using OAuth or any of these guys, um, they're never a one-stop solution. You're always going to have to like modify it or get it to a point where it works for you, right? Like when you consider things like, um, oh, for example, I built a system a while ago that works on invite only, which means I invite you, I give you a temporary token, you come to my application with your temporary token, and then you create your application and then submit that. Cool. Seems like it should be a straightforward thing. Seems like it should be something that exists. Unfortunately, it doesn't. None of the strategies actually support that. So I had to write my own strategy that did. So things like that. So that will happen often where you wind up having to come up with a convention that doesn't exist in a strategy. So understanding how authentication works at a more granular level will give you that, that skill set in order to approach that. All right. So in order to do that, we're actually going to have to create another model. And we're going to do double duty. Like We could have roles, but that gets a little bit more sophisticated. And roles, roles are kind of a touchy subject because permissions with roles works in two different ways. Either a role provides permissions or a role receives permissions, and that gets kind of tricky. So I wanted to keep it as simplistic as possible. So I think for our users, we're going to have authors, and an author will own a set of blogs. Makes perfect sense. Anybody can sign up. We're not going to do it by invite. Nothing too sophisticated, right? Just very, very basic stuff. So actually creating the author model is no different than the way we created the blog model. It's very, very similar. However, we're going to explore some helper methods today as well. The helper methods will give us the ability to do things like checking if a user is authenticated, hashing their password, doing hash work comparisons, those type of things, making our user experience and our developer experience a lot better. And I, I feel like that's the one thing that tends to get forgotten about. Um, we're always pushing to make the user experience better. But sometimes the developer's experience needs to also be just as good. And so when you find that there's um, when you find that there's a way to make your experience better by building out utilities or tools, you should take advantage of that and definitely try to make your life a lot easier, right? Um, it's a two-way street though, because what tends to happen is you build this really awesome tool and then you forget how it works and you just start using it and 
that's it. And then you don't remember how it was done in the first place until it breaks and you have to go fix it. <laughs> All right, so um, we're not going to create a new branch just because I've been having serious branch issues lately. Um, we will navigate to our branch. So wherever you put it, I'm not sure how you're actually doing it, whether you guys are using Finder to do it or whether you're going through the actual terminal. And, uh, projects and conk, Monday, there we go. And it's kind of annoying, but some of you are able to do like code dot and open up your application. For some reason on my Mac, I must have changed what code actually points to, so I can't seem to do that. So I have to actually open it up the old fashioned annoying way. Oh, there was a nice update, actually. Oh, I bet you I do. Yep, I certainly do. I mean, for the 10 seconds it takes, it's totally worth it. <laughs> oh, and then don't show that again. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to collapse all the stuff that I have open here. <clears throat> and I'm hoping I have everything in place. Uh, let me just check my app.js just to make sure I've got body parser. Yeah, I've got body parser and I've got sessions. And I've got the cookie parser and everything. So it looks like I've got everything I need. So this should be the right branch, hopefully. So in my actual terminal for now, I'm just going to type nodemon and start my server. NPM start if you're using NPM. It's always a good idea to do that in case you've been kind of playing around with it over the week. And then navigate to localhost 4000. And it looks like everything is okay. I've got some blogs. I've got three pages. The home looks great. The boat is crappy. <laughs> and contact is crappy. All right, so we're going to create a author model that will allow us to basically have a user account. And the author model, like I said, looks almost identical to the way the blogs model is. So if you click on your models folder, right click on it and choose to create a new file, and we're going to call it author.js, and that's going to create an empty file for us. As I said before, the actual model files only really require three pieces. The first piece is the mongoose library. So we require it and store it in a variable called mongoose. I mean, you don't have to call it mongoose, it just makes sense. It requires a schema. which will be a new mongoose.schema. And it requires to be exported. Now we could like fix this by just exporting it in a different way, but we'll do it this way because it just makes more sense. It's more verbose. And we're going to call it author because that just makes sense. And pass it the author schema as the second argument. Oh, I've got to get rid of that thing. It's so annoying. Give me two seconds here. This linter has... It's done. It's not coming back. <laughs> it is literally the most annoying thing in the world. Is this it? No, that's code snippets. Code snippets. Live share, prettier, rainbow brackets. No. Ruby, standard JS, JavaScript standard style. I think it's this guy that's causing the problems. Go away. Okay, one second, I'm just going to close this and reopen it. There. 
Let's go. Just can't stand the constant underlying issues that it constantly gives. That linter is the worst. <clears throat> all right, so now that's all of the three pieces we need. Our library, our schema, and then export our schema out. Perfectly easy. Now we can actually give our schema an argument. And the argument that we're going to give, the schema actually takes two arguments. But the first argument we're going to give it is the actual layout of our model and how we want it to look. Mongo, as I stated way before, is a super slutty database. doesn't care what you give it. As long as you give it something, it will write it to the collection. It does not care. But because we don't necessarily want that, we want to keep our data normalized, serialized, validated, and in some sort of structure, the schema allows us to be able to kind of force a structure forces data typing, it forces validations, uh, it can force pre-saves and stuff like that. It gives us a lot more control over what happens to the data before it winds up in the Mongo database, right? So that's where the schema comes into play. And the schema takes an object as its first argument, and the object will be made up of different properties. So I'm just going to give it an empty object and let you guys do the same just to make sure you're on track. <clears throat> Once you've created the object, go ahead and put your cursor in the middle of that object and hit enter. And then we're going to give our schema some keys. And the keys are representations of what our attribute names inside our Mongo database will be, right? So it makes sense for an author, you would want the name, right? And it's usually a good idea to separate the name into two pieces so it's easier to sort and filter names, right? So you usually do first name, last name. Um, email. Right, so you want an email address. Uh, and then because we're going to be using this for authentication, probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have a password field, right? So a place to actually store the password. Now all of these are going to be strings, which is totally fine, because the password field, when we actually go to add the password data into it, it'll be hashed anyway. So it'll be useless to anybody who pulls it. All right, so the first piece we're going to create is first name, and it will be its value will be an object last name and its value will be an object email and I'm sure you can guess what its value is going to be and password and its value is also an object now schema can take a second argument and that argument is actually options options that you want to enable on your schema and one of the main options that we tend to do is timestamps. So if you put your cursor next to the closing curly brace at the end of the first argument, hit comma, add a new object, empty object, and hit enter, we're going to add a key called timestamps, and we're just going to say true, which turns them on. And when I save, Prettify takes over and formats all my code, which might make it actually a little bit more legible. I don't know. <laughs> I got in trouble the other day. I was fixing the Google scraper at work. And I was doing it in VS Code. And I've got pretty, prettier, it's called. And it, what it does is it basically formats your code to look like a proper standard. And um, so I was working in Phantom JS, and this file we've got is like almost 2,000 lines, right? And I didn't even think about it. I hit save, push it up, right? So the next guy opens it up, and he's now got all of his function, because whoever wrote most of the functions in this did not do it the correct way. Instead of using like an, an object to put your parameters in, it's just like a list of 27 parameters that you now have to remember the order of. And what Prettier does is it takes those parameters, and it moves them down so they're all on an individual line. <laughs> So now this file goes from like 2,000 lines to like 3,000 lines because now all the parameters are all on their own line. <laughs> Super annoying. <laughs> He's like, you can fix that. <laughs> like, no. Um, so the options that we put into first name, last name, email, and password, you can leave them empty. That is completely possible. Um, it's just not recommended because you want to give those attributes an actual data type uh, so that way you can maintain some normalization with your data, right? Because, you know, maybe somebody's got the first name five. If they enter five, it'll be treated as a number and it will go into the database as a number. 
whereas you know go cool obviously go cool is not a number <laughs> so it will go in as a string right so you want to kind of maintain that normalization so what we do is we add the properties that kind of make that constraint we say the type is a string and then we can add another parameter that allows us to add a little bit of validation you can even do custom validation as well but we don't need anything that robust all we really need to do is say required is true We can do a pattern validation, which will allow us to actually validate the pattern of the email and then create an enforcement on that validation. But um, I have a whole lesson dedicated to validation, so we'll do that later. Yeah. Under last name, I mean, all of these are going to be the same thing. So why don't we cheat a little bit? Let's uh, take our cursor, highlight, type string, and require true. And now for some magic. Multi-line is alt in Windows. How do you create cursors in multiple areas? Does anybody know? Is it Control or Alt or Control Alt? It's Alt? Okay. So if you're in Windows and VS Code, it's Alt. If you're in Sublime in Windows, it's Control. And if you're on a Mac, it's Command. If you put your cursor in the first little bracket there, hold down either Alt, Control, or Command, depending on which operating system you're in, and create two more cursors in between the objects. So you should have three little blinking cursors. Okay. Once you've done that, hit enter to split them up. So now they're all open. And then hit command V to paste that content into three separate locations. <coughs> in all honesty, you probably could have typed it faster. but. Learning these little shortcuts is super handy because it comes up quite often. So that gives us first name, last name, email, and password. They're all type string and they are all required. Now, I'm not going to get into, we're going to take this step by step so it goes really nice and simple. Okay, we'll do the bcrypt part in its own separate piece. <clears throat> Anybody still typing out the model just before I move into the next step? Okay. So the next piece we're going to need, because author is a new resource, there's always four pieces we use, right? We have our model, right? Our routes, because we always need routes, the controller, and the view, right? A lot of people like to think MVC, model view controller, but it's it's almost should be better called RMV because <laughs> it's routing models, views, and controllers, right? Because you need all four of those components in order to make it work. That is very important to remember when you take the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> just, a, just a note there. <laughs> all right, so our author controller, you're going to be so happy, it's actually quite small. It only contains two actions because we're not going to allow people to change their password or their identification, mostly because of laziness. But anyways, so right-click on controllers, choose a new file, and this one is going to be called authors controller singular dot js. <clears throat> so authors with a plural controller singular dot js. Now because we're obviously going to be interacting with the resource, we need to require the resource, right? So let's create a author variable and make it equal to the model. There we go. Like I said, we're only going to have two actions. We're going to have new and create, and that is it. You'll be able to create an author. Okay? <laughs> you will not be able to view all of the authors. You will not be able to show a singular author. You will not be able to update or destroy an author, which is perfectly fine for what we're doing right now. If you want to be able to roll those particular um, strategies that's not hard you can simply copy the logic from blogs and switch it out with the name author pretty much right but keep in mind though that an author is its own environment right an author should not be able to destroy another author an author really ideally shouldn't be able to destroy themselves either right they should be able to update themselves and maybe we'll implement that but they shouldn't be able to update other authors either <laughs> that should definitely be restricted actions right all right, so we're going to have exports new. 
And obviously that takes a request object and a response object from the callback and receives a block. And then go ahead and duplicate that and change the word new to create. And you now have two actions. I'm not sure if I told you guys, I built this um, model view controller system called Sparky. And it's built in PHP. And the only reason I built it is because the owner of the web shop that I was working for, the web agency I was working for, um, only wanted to work in PHP because PHP developers are so cheap, they're easy to find. And uh, so he didn't want to work in Rails. And I love Rails. It's like my home world. I love Rails. So I was like, okay, that's totally cool. And we were doing um, WordPress mostly, and I hate WordPress. And it's, to be honest with any agency that hires me to do WordPress is just wasting money because it's costing too much for that. So he got a big project in, and he wanted to actually work on the big project called ASB Heat. And the guy was in, like explicit, like, this is not WordPress. I do not want WordPress. I don't want a blogging platform for my product catalog. Doesn't make sense. And I agree with him. Totally didn't make any sense at all. So I took advantage of it, and we built Rails in PHP. So it works exactly like the rail, way Rails does. Routing works like Rails does. Rendering works like Rails does. Everything works like Rails. The thing is absolutely amazing. One of the biggest issues that I will tell you that you will encounter is when you're typing out these actions, because you'll be doing it for every single model you create, you start to develop this need for something like a scaffolding utility. And what a scaffolding utility does is you would type in a uh, new model, right? Give it your fields that you want it to create and hit enter. That would generate the model. It would immediately generate a controller, create it for you and populate it with all seven standard actions. It would generate a routes file for you and populate it with the routes, everything all in one go. So it's already there. Anyways, thought that was interesting. I might, I might build one for you and then distribute it. And then you guys can see it. And then all we have to do is new model. <laughs> Anyways, just a note. Um, okay, so inside each of these, after my tangent there, and you guys all looking at me blankly, uh, we're going to render our new view. Now, new doesn't need to access the blog because we're not pulling any information back, or not the blog, sorry, from the model, because we're not pulling any information back from the model. We are literally just rendering a new view for whoever's going to sign up as a new user, right? So that's easy, it's just res, right? For the response, render, which is the action that we usually call on it. Does anybody remember what the first argument to the render is? Path to the view, right? Yeah. Authors, new. And it also takes a second argument that we're going to utilize, which would be our locals. And locals are variables available to you within your view. Now exports create, obviously we're going to need to access the model because what's going to happen is the user's going to go to the new view, they're going to fill out their form, they're going to hit submit, that post data is going to come through our request cycle, hit the router. The router is going to be like, yep, I know exactly where that's going. That's going to our create action on our controller. Sends the post form data to the controller, and now we have it. Now we got to do something with it. So we might as well create an author with it, right? So in order to do that, we're going to do author.create. And... I'm going to do the same kind of pattern that we did with blogs, where we namespace our parent, like our arguments, our values that are going to create the new author under an author object. So we'll be doing request dot body dot author. When you create, it returns a promise. Promises come with two optional methods. There's a then and a catch, right? So the then usually catches, see I hate that word, the then will receive a success, right? And the catch will receive an error. <clears throat> if there is no catch and there's an error thrown, where does it go? Does anybody remember from last week? Mm -mm. 
So if, sorry, if the promise rejects something, where does that rejection go? Because it doesn't throw an error. And it doesn't go to logs. It'll go to then. So then is like a catch-all. Then's like, I'll take anything you got. Doesn't matter whether it's resolved or rejected. So that's one kind of annoying thing, and it tends to catch people up. If you only have it then, it will literally take any resolution that promise gives. So if it resolves it, it will go to then. If it rejects it, it will go to then. That's why it is so imperative that you use then and catch. Because if it rejects it, catch will pick it up. If it resolves it, then we'll pick it up. So it's important to understand. All right, so we're also going to need dot catch <clears throat> for that very reason. You are right, though, Gokul. If it does throw an error, everything goes right, and the error gets called. However, if you have a catch in there, the catch will pick up the error for you. So it kind of does double duty. Not only does it pick up the rejection, it will also pick up any errors that happen to get thrown by the application. All right, so now in your then, like I said, it's just going to receive a positive. So we'll just create a anonymous function in here. We'll do a flash message on our request. So request.flash, not error, success, success. You are now registered. <clears throat> and you know what? It would be nice to log them in directly, but instead for now we'll just redirect them. Redirect, sorry, to slash login, where we'll actually create a login form for them. <clears throat> a better user experience when you register somebody is to immediately log them in. That's usually a better user experience. But for simplicity's sake, that's what we'll do for now. The catch, obviously, we're going to take an error and fire that off to an, to an anonymous uh, function. And then there we'll have a flash with an error message. Use some dirty backticks, error, with a bit of string interpolation. And then we'll redirect them back to authors new. <clears throat> we could do a locals and add the author into the local and repopulate the form, uh, but I don't want to. So we'll just do that. Yeah, there is also that issue. <laughs> yeah, you're right. No, Go cool is right. Um, the redirect actually doesn't take locals. We'd have to render the view. with locals, which would be fine. Because in this scenario, did I do the thing with you guys? Where it's like the reason why we redirect is to stop people from triple tapping and creating three of a version. So the reason why we redirect is because the browser is stateless, right? So when we submit our form and we come to this post action, we have our form body. And what's happening is it's like this two-step process. So here's my request. I've submitted the form, I now have this connection to my form, and now here's my form body inside here. If I hit refresh, that form body is still sitting in that state and will be submitted back through the post. Every time you hit refresh, it will keep submitting it back through the post. So if I have done this three or four times, I will create four versions of this particular post. By redirecting, that post body goes gone, brand new state. I'm now in a different point in my application, and the post body is disappeared, and I don't have to worry about them, you know, creating multiple versions of it. However, if we do it in the error, that makes sense because even if they hit refresh, it doesn't matter. It's already errored out. If they hit refresh, it's just going to error again. So we don't really care, right? It doesn't really make a big difference. We're not going to wind up creating more versions of it. But we'll just leave it this way. Um, that's it. That's the whole author's controller. I mean, we're motoring along pretty good, actually. Let's create some routes. right? So we have author, the model. We have the controller. Now we need the actual routes so that we have a way to get to these controller actions. So uh, under your routes folder, 
you're going to create a new routes file called authors.js with an S. And we will need five lines in total. You're going to have the router. And we might as well access the method right off the bat, make our lives a little simpler. We'll have the controller. We'll have routes, which I'll just do for that. And then we'll need to export our changes. We're only going to have two routes. One will point to the new action, and the other is going to point to the create action. And I'm going to let you write those for yourselves. I'll give you a, I'll give you two minutes <laughs> to write those two actions for yourselves. If you forget what they look like, go look in the blogs controller. That should help you. You're going to create a route that points to new and a route that points to create. And they are the same that we did for blogs, just for authors controller. You good, Adrian? Do you want to give me what they are? Uh, yep. Uh, yep. Uh, Great. And the next one? Right. Dot post. Yep. Dot create. Perfect. <clears throat> did you do it by memory or did you do it from the blogs controller? <laughs> you know the answer, Sean. Why ask the question? <laughs> so I kind of lied. We have four files we kind of dip into, but we actually have five because we have to go to routes.js and take this authors and add it to our routes.js configuration. So open routes.js. The easier way to do this would be to create something like an autoloader. What an autoloader's purpose is, is it goes through and would look through our route files and autoload them one at a time. So whenever a new route file shows up, it would autoload it. That would be much better. Um, however, in the past when I tried to use autoloaders, they just never seemed to work properly. So I gave up. Authors, I mean I could put more attention into it. Authors routes. And we'll change this to authors. And authors. There you go. Two lines that you need to type. Crap, we're here like right on schedule. This is so weird. We're never on schedule. <laughs> I may have an answer for you, AJ. So in the author's routing file. Yes. When we post to slash or root. Yes. Is that like the active project group or is that relative to the previous app route? That is relative to authors. So here's the reason. Yeah, so here's what's happening. So in our routes file here, right? Yeah. When we start out, router is pointing to slash. That's its default. It's the slash of, slash just means the path name. So it's whatever your root of your domain is, and then that's slash. When, so all the page routes are all slash and whatever their names are. Blogs means we've now namespaced any routes defined under blogs routes under blogs. So it's slash blogs and then whatever those routes are. 
And then with authors, same deal, slash authors, and then whatever those routes are under the authors file. Like, if we didn't want to do it that way, because it's kind of convoluted looking, we could, under the authors file, actually prepend every path with the word authors. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing with that file. Yeah, and that's totally fine. That should work. Yeah, and you would think it wouldn't, because you'd think the app use would overwrite each other, but they, they will only overwrite if the route is the same name. If it's the same name, that it will overwrite. Otherwise, it will just keep adding them on, one at a time. Either one is perfectly fine. I mean, um, I had one student who refused to do this kind of setup, and he just did one in one entire routes file. He just had one routes file, and he just put all the routes in it. The thing was a mess, but there was a lot of routes, and you knew where they were, so it didn't really matter. I'm not picky, as long as you have them kind of separated. My big whole issue is about mixing your controller actions and your routes together, because that's a common practice in Express. Um, it's gross. It's like, it's does not... It's not the way it should be. Like MVC is meant to be separated. Your controllers should be separate. Your models and your views should be separate. And it does work out to be beneficial for you because now with these routes, you can actually add extra logic that are route specific without contaminating it into your controller logic. I mean, it's an opinion, but that's just how I feel. All right, routes, authors, authors, controllers, and author. So we should have all of those. Is anybody missing any pieces? No? You're hoping not? <laughs> All right. Author view. Like I said, we're going to cheat. If you jump over to your browser, make sure you've opened up the lesson builder. You can find it at comp-2068-assistant.ruka.app.com. If you don't want to type that out, just go to Blackboard and click the link. <laughs> I mean, you can bookmark it. They're literally all on there. And then once you get there, scroll to where it says author view. And the first one is views authors form.pug. Go ahead and copy that. Command C or Control C. And then in your IDE under views, you're going to create a new folder called authors. So we're going to create a new folder under our views called authors, new folder, authors. And in there, you're going to create a new file called form.pug. And you're going to paste that form into it. And incidentally, if you wanted to create the update and edit views, it probably would not take a heck of a lot. <laughs> The trick is, is the logic for dealing with password confirmation becomes kind of convoluted. That's the only reason why I left it out. So in this form, what you will notice is we have a first name, last name, email, but then we also have password and password confirmation. Now, whenever we're dealing with models in an MVC environment, models are very, very rigid and require things to be in the form that you promised they were going to be in. Now we're just hand, handing the author this object and we have this extra attribute called password confirmation in there. And it's going to get that and then it's going to go, whoa, 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 dude, you, you said nothing about this particular field. Where did this come from? Nope, not writing. Not doing nothing. And then it just sits on its hands and nothing happens, right? And the only reason is, is because it doesn't know what password confirmation is. We never told it about it. Broke our promises. We can handle that, but at the end of the day, we don't want to write password confirmation to the database. It doesn't make any sense, right? We're only, we've already got password, we've done the password thing, we're not gonna write the password confirmation to the database. So what we will have to do is do something called virtual attributes. And what a virtual attribute is, is it allows the model to understand what password confirmation is, it allows it to be able to access it and deliver it, and also receive it, but when it comes to writing or reading to the database, it will not use it. It ignores it. It pretends it's not even there. Which means we don't have to worry that when we pass it our object that it will accidentally write password confirmation to our database, because it won't. We're going to explore that more in depth. I'm just explaining it because it's currently on the page. All right, we also need a new view. So under authors, right click, choose new file, new.js. Once again, jump over to here, and it's literally right underneath the form. So just copy it.
jump back into your IDE, paste it in that new view, and hit enter. And I lost all my formatting for some bizarre reason. Oh, yeah, that's because I did something stupid and called it new JS instead of new pug. Rename, for those of you that did the same, <laughs> and call it pug. Then paste it. Then it works like a charm. And the telltale sign should have been that the synth wave broke entirely. <laughs> For those of you that are forgetting what this is doing, extends, takes our layout file, and basically takes everything that we define nested in the content and dumps that into that main.pug file. The con dot container is the class name container. Um, header is header, h1 is h1. The div is the div. The include there is including our form that's in that file into there that's known as partials. We've created a partial called form, and we're including it in. <clears throat> and the reason we're doing that is if we do build an edit page, it will actually allow us to put the uh, use the exact same form for the edit page, right? So we don't have to duplicate logic. Anybody still writing out? No? All right, let me take a look to see if we should at least talk about this before we move on. You know what, we might as well. We'll do the password and authentication helper thing and then we'll take a break. <clears throat> All right, we need to go to author. We're going to live in the model for a little bit. Live in the moment, live in the model. Let's talk about bcrypt. So bcrypt is this really popular library that's available to so many different programming languages, it's not even funny. I guarantee you, in your career as a programmer, you will come across bcrypt in another language other than JavaScript. You will come across it in PHP, Ruby. I think that there's a rolled up method for um, Java, because there is definitely one for C++. bcrypt is a very common encryption library that exists, um, and it's used quite heavily for doing exactly what we're going to use it for today, which is dealing with passwords. It's not limited to that, though. You can also use it for encrypting any data, really, because people use it for encrypting uh, like credit card numbers and stuff like that, or just running constant encryption. Uh, Bcrypt, the one thing to note about it is it's a, it's a unidirectional um, encryption, which means it's one way. So once it's encrypted, it can't be decrypted. You can't go the other way and actually unencrypt what you've just encrypted, which is very good. That's a, that's a, that's a strong way to do password management because it means the password gets created, it gets added to the database, and now you're taking a person's plain text password, encrypting it, and then comparing the two encryptions to see if they match. So if somebody downloads your database, unless they've got like a serious like decryption operation going on, it would take a ton of processing power and a ton of hardware in order to decrypt all those passwords. It is not worth their time. Right? So any system that is currently encrypted with bcrypt, they're going to look at other vulnerabilities. One, that you aren't doing, um, that you aren't managing sessions properly. And because of that, what they'll do is they'll hammer your, your login form with just every possible combination that they can possibly come up with until they finally get in. Um, that's usually pretty common. It's called a brute force attack. But there's ways around that. Can somebody brute force this thing that we're building right now? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> because we aren't managing sessions in that way. Um, if we wanted to stop that, what we would have to do is actually capture the person's IP address, the number of times that they are attempting to authenticate in a, in a second, and then we blacklist them after a while. But it's actually better not to do that even at this level. It's actually better to do it at the server level. Because usually somebody will hammer the same page and at the server level, your server should check that, and when it sees it being hammered multiple times in a quick succession, it will blacklist the IP. It's a much better way to deal with that. All right, um, so like I said, it's quite popular. Uh, it's unidirectional, which means it goes in one way. Uh, it is a lot harder to hack, as a hacker has to try pushing passwords against it repeatedly in order to crack it. Not impossible, though, just difficult. 
Um, to use bcrypt, we actually have to install another node module to get this thing working. So jump over to your these things, and it will say that stuff has gone sideways and it's crashed. That's totally fine. <clears throat> we're just missing some of the connected pieces. And in here, we're going to do an npm. And we've been typing install, but you actually don't need to. You can do npm i, which is short for install. And it's just bcrypt, which is b, the letter b, c r y p t. Hit enter. That will install bcrypt for us. What? OK. Cool. I don't know what that is, but cool. Yeah. I don't know what pre is. I've never seen that before. So once we have it, we're actually, this is the one time we're not taking a module and adding it to app.js. This module is going directly into the author model, because that's the place where we're going to use it. So I'm going to turn no daemon back on. Let it blow up. And just underneath my uh, what's happening? Oh, yeah, definitely don't copy and paste what's in the um, <coughs> lesson plan because it's definitely not right. Uh, we're going to have bcrypt in here, so it'll be const bcrypt equals require bcrypt. So that'll require the bcrypt library. And then we're going to create a constant called salt work factor. You can literally call it anything, but we're going to call it salt work factor, and we're going to set it to 10. So what the salt work factor is, is it is the number of iterations we want to do in order to create a salt key. What a salt key essentially is, is we take your password, we generate a salt key, we add your salt key to the password, and then we hash the whole object. So not only in order to decrypt this would you need to know my password, you would also need to know the salt key I used in order to decode the password. So it's not worth your time. It's too hard. All right, so that's going to do that. Uh, the default that Node uses as a salt key um, generator is 10, so we're using the same number of iterations. Cool. Cool beans. So like I said before, we, um, we have password confirmation and we need to deal with that because the model's not going to understand what password confirmation is. So we're going to use something called virtual attributes or virtual properties. And basically what a virtual attribute is, is it allows us to have a field that can be referenced and used but won't be written to the database. We don't have to worry about it being written either in an update or in a create. Um, it's only usable to deal with the fact that the model's going to question what this thing is, that we just all of a sudden handed it. The other good thing about it is we kind of need it anyways because if they're giving us a password and they're giving us a confirmed password, we're going to confirm them and make sure that they're the same thing. So we're going to write a virtual uh, property. So just bring your mouse to the end of your schema. Hit enter a couple of times so that you're just sitting above module.exports. Maybe write a comment in there so you know what this is. Virtual property or slash attribute or password confirmation. <clears throat> so the syntax goes author schema, so you reference the schema object. You access the method called virtual, which is a function. Virtual receives the property name as the argument that you want to use. So it's password confirmation with a capital C. We can also set two other pieces here. We can set what happens when a person tries to access that and when a person tries to set it. So the getters and setters for it. Both of these methods actually take a callback. 
So we'll just use our handy arrow function syntax. Actually, we don't even need the curly braces because we're literally doing one line. And if you remember arrow functions, if you're only doing one line, you don't need the curly braces because it will just implicitly return. So we can get rid of those curly braces. And we're literally just going to say this password confirmation, which means if a person tries to access it, they're going to get back the one that is currently set, which can be undefined. That's totally fine. And then we have a setter. The setter takes a callback as well. The setter will actually pass an argument to this called value, or we're going to call it value. This dot password confirmation will be equal to value. And that sets it. <clears throat> so when get gets called is I have an object, like I have a model, I've received a document, and I'm going to call document.password confirmation. And what it's going to do is it's going to return back a password confirmation. The problem is this password confirmation 90% of the time is going to be empty. It's going to be undefined, right? 10% of the time we're in the middle of creating a document and I haven't saved it yet, I will be able to access it. That's totally fine. Setter works a little differently. Set will happen when we do a create or an update. If we have passed this dot password confirmation, what it's going to do is it's going to take the value of it currently, it's going to assign it to this dot password confirmation, and now it becomes available to us through our process. So that's what setter is going to do. This will not get saved in the end. It won't wind up in our database, but it will be accessible to us. It's a little confusing. Um, I did post a link to the documentation as well, just in case you require. All right, so we're almost done. We still want another helper action. Right now what's happening is a person is giving us a password and it's in plain text. We're taking that plain text password and we're passing it into our database. If we save a plain text password, we're basically target, right? <laughs> I mean, that's basically, no, you guys don't get that reference, really? The target hack, you don't remember the target hack? It was like four years ago. <laughs> All right. Anyways, Target saved a whole bunch of passwords and login details and credit card numbers in plain text in the database. Massive hack happened. And of course, they were like flamed everywhere, right? And it's not the first big company that's done that. Tons of companies have done this crap where they save passwords as plain text in a database. Do you save passwords as plain text? Hells no. <laughs> it's not a thing. So in order to stop that, what we have to do is take the password and hash it before we save. This is when we get into something called hooks. We need to do this at a certain point in the life cycle of our query, right? So here's how the life cycle of our query goes. We access our blog and we call create, right? We give it the arguments. The first piece is, is it takes our arguments and it runs any pre-save hooks that are in place. Most times we have none, so it's like cool. Then it moves on to the next state and validates. So it's checking, the first piece it checks is that all the data types are correct. Next it checks to make sure that all the attributes are the correct attributes that you stated, like so the ones that you listed in your schema. And then the last thing it does is it validates and providing all of those three checks pass then it will actually finally take the model or the, the, the data and save it to the database. We want to kind of like plug ourselves in before the validation, normalization, and sanitization happens. So we want to do a pre-save, right? And we can do that quite easily by doing author schema. Actually, let's write a comment before this because you're definitely going to want to remember this one. So our hook operation. And give it an argument called pre, or sorry, a method called pre. <clears throat> Pre's first argument is when. When in the life cycle do you want to fire off this app, this particular function? And the where we want to actually, we want to do it before we save. So before we save, I want to call whatever this function is. The second argument, as I'm sure you can guess, is an actual callback. 
This is one of these times we cannot use an arrow function because the context of this is super important. And the context of this needs to be author schema. It can't be something else. So the problem with an arrow function is the context of this will be the window object. We don't want it to be, sorry, it'll actually be the module object. We want to make sure it's author schema. So we have to do function. Inside the function, it's going to get the next argument. And what next will do essentially is once we're done our pre and we finished everything, we call next and it says, okay, now you can move on with your life cycle and do whatever it is you're going to do. You know there's more. <laughs> Put your cursor inside those curly braces. There's like 14 lines right inside there. Let's give it some space, room to breathe. First, we want to take this, which is the context of the author schema, and we're going to assign it to a variable so that we have it throughout our application. So const author equals this. Trust me, I tried to figure out a way around this because it feels so super hacky. Next, I want to check to see if the author has not been modified because if nothing has changed with the password, there is absolutely no reason for me to go through this whole hassle, right? So I'm going to say if author, so bang author dot is modified. So this isn't saying if author is modified, this is saying if author is not modified. That's what the exclamation mark means, right? That is a method and it takes whatever particular property it is you want to check. I want to check password. And we might as well do this on one line because we're literally just doing this. So. Next, we're going to do a little bit of a validation check. I want to know if the password matches the password confirmation. Because if those two things do not match, I want to get out of there. I just get out of Dodge and give them an error message saying, these two things don't match. You need to go back to the drawing board. So I'm going to say, if author.password does not equal, explicitly not equal, author.password confirmation. And again, I'm just going to do this on one line. Throw new error. And that takes a string. Your password does not match your password confirmation. So that might be a bit new. Um, the throw new error part. I don't know if you guys have seen that before, but that's how we can actually explicitly throw an error. So by doing that, that will actually fire off. If, if something is listening to this using catch, it will actually fire off the error and catch will catch it and then go on. <coughs> Which will likely happen in our controller. Right? All right. Now we're ready for the fun stuff. Password must be modified, right, in order for us to get to this point. Password and password confirmation match. We're good. We're now ready to encrypt the password. So the first piece, we want to generate a salt key. So we're going to do bcrypt.gen salt. Add the number of factors we want to happen. So 10 or the salt work factor. And then it takes a callback. And the callback takes two arguments, error and salt. It's a good place for async and await, but I don't want to get into that for those of you that know how to use async. Anyway. 
Put your uh, cursor in the middle of the curly braces. Hit enter so that you're now on the next line. If there's an error, return next with the error. Otherwise, we're going to hash the password. Finally, finally we're at the point where we're going to hash the password. Decrypt dot hash. That takes three arguments in total. It takes the plain text password, so author dot password. It takes the salt key that you generated, so salt. And then it takes a callback which receives two arguments, error and hash. So quite a bit in that one. If you really wanted to simplify this like to ridiculousness, you would only need this line, and you could literally just change salt to whatever string you want to make up on the fly. <laughs> when I did it last night, I did it with Boo Rakacha. It's not as good as letting the salt thing do it itself, though. All right, next thing. Put your cursor in those curly braces, split them apart. And once again, if there's an error, then we're going to next that error. Otherwise, we're going to say author.password is equal to our hash. And we're just going to call next with nothing inside of it. So quite a bit of a hook operation. So once again, pre means we have a hook at some point in the life cycle of our author schema query. Okay, This will only ever be called when we attempt to save, which happens when we do create or explicitly call save. So this will happen before the actual save operation occurs, before it saves. And before any validation occurs, any schema check occurs, anything like that, this is going to happen. <clears throat> we give it, it takes two arguments, it takes when it happens, and the callback. In the callback, it's going to get back an object called next, which allows us to move next to the next part of the cycle of the life cycle. We assign this to the author so that we can access the owner object throughout our application. Check to see if it's modified. If it's not, we next it. Check to see if the password confirmation matches. If it doesn't, we throw an error to basically say your password does not match. That's essentially our validation check. And then we can move on with our lives if that's the case and they can fix their password. Otherwise, we generate a salt key at a factor of 10. We pass that salt into the callback. We use that salt to hash the password. And we return the whole process back out and begin with start our life cycle all over again. So that granularly is how we actually go through and create a salt password. Clear as a bell, isn't it? Once again, this is one of those things that you, you're not likely going to remember. You're going to go through your notes, and you're going to find it, and you're going to copy and paste it probably for the next four years. Or you'll roll passport. <laughs> one of those two things will occur, which is totally I'm okay with that. <laughs> Um, all right, so we have the authenticate helper. So once we have a hash password, we will need to be able to actually check plain text passwords against the password, the hash password, because you have to remember the password inside our database is hashed, right? So say the person's password is ASDF, and they type ASDF into the login form and hit enter. Obviously, ASDF is not going to match the 256 key passwords that's currently sitting in the database. Those things do not look the same, right? So the way around that is by taking ASDF, hashing it, and then comparing the two hashes together. But bcrypt supports that. It does all that for us. So all we have to do is create a way to authenticate, some way to authenticate those and compare those two passwords. So we're going to build a helper method. So let's do slash slash our helper method. And then I promise we'll take a break. <clears throat> So this helper method is going to allow us to compare our password to a plain text. This will allow us to compare 
our password to to plain text. Cool. So to create a helper method, we actually create it on the author schema under the methods property, and we can add as many in there as we want. But they then will become available to us. Uh, all we have to do is access our like get a blog post or whatever or sorry, an author post, and once we have the author record, we can actually go ahead and call authenticate on it. Uh, so we're going to do author schema dot methods dot authenticate. We're going to make that equal to a callback function that will take a plain password, so ASDF in this scenario, and a callback function. Then we're going to do a comparison, and the comparison takes three arguments. It takes plain text, takes a hash, and takes the callback. So that is going to look like this. bcrypt dot compare plain password this dot password, which is the hash password error sorry, that's a callback which will take air and is match as arguments. <clears throat> error will obviously hold our error. Is match will obviously be a boolean of either true or false. Did the passwords match? True. Did the passwords match? False. Now we just need to handle the error. So if error return the callback error. Otherwise, call back, uh, sorry, null, bleh, null, and is match. And then go ahead and save that. And if I'm correct, this thing should be blowing up like mad. Yep. Oh, except for I have an error because of the way I named this. Uh, I did a lowercase s, and I should have did a capital case s on schema. Oops. It's a lot. <laughs> I get it. It's a lot. <laughs> But at least you have authentication now. And once it's up in, you know, Heroku land, you don't have to worry about people like just typing in dirty limericks and stuff inside your blogs. <laughs> However, they can make as many authors as they want. <laughs> so there is always that. All right. Why don't we take a break? I mean, let's take a good 20. Take 20 minutes, and then after that, we'll just power through to the end of the night and leave. Sound good? All right, let's do 20. All right, let's talk about sessions. So we've created an author, right? And authors are our users. And you'll find that in model view controller systems, actually most frameworks that deal with web applications, they like to separate two things. They like to separate users from sessions. And they treat sessions as almost like a resource on its own, right? And what a session is, is it's a managed period of time that the user is in your application. So whenever you guys are surfing around the web and you go to a website, you're often assigned a session, has a key, a unique key that is directed for you, and your activity is recorded underneath that session. Now, I don't mean recorded as in, like, you know, they're tracking every mouse click and stuff like that. Though they can. Um, I mean more like it's, it's individual to you. It's you that owns this particular piece. So that includes logging in. That includes adding things to your cart, your cookies. All of those type of things are all added under your session, under your environment for you. Sessions are not 100% secure. They can be hijacked, right? There's man-in-the-middle attacks that actually hijack a session which allows that hacker to pretend to be you. And now they're logged in. 
right? Because they they've assumed your session cookies, they've assumed your session variables, and they've become you. So if you've been adding stuff to your Amazon cart, it's now in their Amazon cart, right? But now they also have your credit card checkout and all the rest of it too, because they they are you essentially. So sessions are an integral part to dealing with the internet because I'm sure when you guys took your uh, HTML class, uh, your HTML teacher stressed that the internet is stateless. And what that means is that when I switch from page to page, anything I did on the page prior has been forgotten by the browser. The browser does not remember the stuff that happened to the page prior. Now we can use things to try to maintain state like cookies. The problem is, is they're not reliable. They are considered unreliable state and the reason is is because the user controls those cookies and can remove them and delete them and there's no way to guarantee they'll be available to you in the next in the next request there is a reliable state though and that we have available to us on the server and that's sessions sessions allow us to be able to um, not only check to see what the user has been doing throughout their progress but also for us to add information in that we can now access from page to page. And we've already been using sessions up to this point. Our flash messaging system is utilizing sessions because when we redirect, anytime we redirect, if our flash message was just a local, it would be gone in the redirect cycle because those locals would be just reset entirely. Whereas with sessions, we actually carry our flash message all the way through to the next request cycle. Right? So, why are sessions important in authentication? Well, sessions are important because your user, once they authenticate, they need to, we need to be able to keep track that they are actually logged in. Otherwise, they'd have to literally authenticate every single page, which means you'd have to have like a login and password field on the page at all times because every single request would require an authentication. That's a terrible user experience. They would get so mad. They would definitely bounce from your site. So, in order to avoid that, we want to keep track of them. The easiest way to keep track of them is by creating a session variable and adding it to the session variable. So like I said, the good news is we already have sessions. We don't actually have to set up anything to do with the actual session module. It's already installed. Underneath our app.js, you can find that right here. This is the wonderful library we're using to do our sessions. We also have the cookie parser library, which will allow us to create cookies and things. We're using our session, and the way Node uses sessions is it actually creates a cookie and then serves the cookie information and stores it in the session piece. So it's all still private, it's still unavailable. When you set these session keys, you can't find them inside the application sessions variables. You don't have to worry about that being a public publicized variable. Um, all right, so what are we going to do? We are going to treat sessions as resources. Essentially what I'm meaning by a session in this scenario is an authenticated session. We are going to treat an authenticated session as a resource. So login will belong to the resource of session. Authenticate will belong to the resource of session and log out will belong to the resource of session. So it will exist in its own controller called sessions controller. So just like with authors, we need the four wonderful pieces. We need routes, controller, no, sorry, three wonderful pieces, no model, no model in this scenario. So routes, controller, and view, right? And we only have how many views, if you think about it? How many views would we have in total? Just one, just login. That's the only view we're gonna have is the login view and a logout link, right? But the logout link will exist in our main map. <coughs> and out of curiosity, See how well we've been paying attention. Will the logout link be a link or a form? How many people say form? How many people say link? You're all wrong. <laughs> it's a form. Why is it a form? Because we're destructing data. We are modifying data. And anytime we modify data, we post it. We don't get it. <laughs> All right, so because we'll be actually modifying the session variable and destroying it, we're going to use post in order to destroy it. Adrian rolls his eyes. Fine, Sean. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's um, let's start with the router this time. I mean, it really doesn't matter what we start with, but let's start with the router. So 
go to routes. Do to do. I'm gonna just collapse all these stupid open folders so it's a little easier to see. All right, here's the routes. I'm gonna right click and choose new file, and this is going to be called sessions.js. Now, this is literally almost identical to authors, right? So you could copy and paste if you wanted to, or you can type it out. I tend to type a little quick, so it's fine. We'll need our sessions controller. I know it doesn't exist yet, so you'll see an error when you save this file. because it won't be able to actually access it. Probably the reason why I usually do the controller first. Oh, I do the module.exports equals router. There we go. And we're gonna have three routes. The first route will point to our login. And I'm going to call the action login. The second route is going to point to authenticate, and it will be posted there. And it's going to point to authenticate. <clears throat> and then the last route will point as a post to log out, and it will be a logout. So login is the only one that will actually gain back a view. <clears throat> However, we'll use a form to actually perform the logout part. Login will get a view. Uh, we're going to need some links <clears throat> to these actual things. <coughs> Sorry. We're going to need some links now that I can talk. I'm going to close off some of these files I've got open here. And we'll put the links under the main nav. This is the first time we've actually edited the main nav before, so pay close attention to where I'm adding these lines because it gets kind of convoluted uh, with all the bootstrap stuff. I'm even going to collapse my sidebar so you can actually easily see it. If you hit Command P or Control P, that will open up your searching thing. And I'm going to type in main nav or the beginnings of main nav and open it up. So we have three links that we're going to add, and we're going to add them under drafts, but above contact. So if you hit enter after drafts and bring your cursor so it's in line with the li on the last one, we're going to do li.navitem. Nav item is a CSS class. Li would be the list tag. I'm going to hit enter and put a space underneath there, and I'm going to do a.nav link. Nav item and nav link are CSS classes provided to us by Bootstrap that will actually format the nav in that nice clean way. This one uh, inside the parentheses you're going to have href equals and then authors, oh no not authors, I don't know why I'm doing that, slash login, sorry. <clears throat> oh no, no that's wrong, of course it's wrong. It's authors new, and afterwards the link is called register, that's why. So we have register, then we're going to have a nav item, a dot nav link, href equals slash login, and that will obviously point to login. And then I'm getting super lazy, so I'm just going to duplicate that, and this will point to slash log out. But that doesn't actually work because we have to give it a form. So I'm actually going to remove that piece.
For this, we're going to create a new class called navdestroy. So it'll be form dot nav destroy and that's because this form is going to look a little different so it looks like the bootstrap navigation it's going to point to log out its method is going to be equal to post and it's only going to have one input So before we actually create the login page, we should probably create a sessions controller. So we have it, and then we'll add the login to the sessions controller, the login action. So I'm going to open up my sidebar. <clears throat> I'm going to create a new folder, or sorry, a new file under controllers. And I'm going to call it sessions controller.js. And that's where we're going to have our sessions controller. Now the sessions controller, while sessions are not going to have a sessions model, though that isn't entirely unheard of, you might have a sessions model if you were keeping track of things like login attempts and stuff like that. We are going to have to include the author's model because that's what we're using to actually compare against to make sure a person's logged in. So we're going to add the author's model at the top line. So const author equals require dot dot models slash author. And then we'll add one action, exports.login, which takes a request object and a response object, and an anonymous function. <clears throat> that was super fucking weird. <laughs> Who is that kid? Oh, no, brother. Brought me coffee. Oh, that's nice. Oh, you gotta like that. That's super sweet. All right, uh, we're going to do a response and render. And we're going to render sessions slash login, which is obviously our view path, but we're missing the view path, so we'll need it when we're done. And I mean, why not send some locals with a nice title of login, and I feel like being colorful, so login sucker. <clears throat> oh, no, that can't be just sucker. Saka. Much better. I'm really just passing time at this point. Like, <laughs> you don't have to write that. <laughs> All right. Login, just as simple as like new view or anything like that. And it essentially is a new view. Um, if you were to do this in Rails with Devise, it would be under the new controller action actually that's where they bury it um, but I like login it's a little bit more verbose but it's really just an opinion under views we're going to need to create a new folder called sessions that's where that login uh, file is going to exist the view right click on sessions make sure you choose new file and create a file in there called login.pug and hit enter And there's two ways you can do this. Either you can jump over to the um, lesson plan and go copy the session slash login.pug view, or you can piece it together from the author's view, like the author's new view, the, where the form is, because two of the fields you're going to need are email and password, and that is it, right? So you can actually piece it all together. I'm going to go over to Google Chrome. Go to my lesson plan view, 
zoom down to where we have sessions, links, login, and to this piece. Copy it. So that's the views slash sessions slash login.pug. Jump over to my login.pug and paste it in place. And now I'm my login form. <coughs> Notice its action is pointing to authenticate and it is a post action. So that's going to actually call the authenticate controller action when you go to submit that. At this point, I do believe we have all the pieces in place. I'm going to kill my server, rerun node bond. I'm going to open my browser and jump over to the adventure of a lifetime and hit command R to refresh. And sure enough, I have register, login and a very inconvenient looking logout button. <laughs> we'll take care of that, don't you worry. But that's a good sign. If you click login, uh-oh, we have a cannot get login. And the reason why is because we created all those session routes, but what did we forget to do? Yeah, we forgot to add it to the routes file. So if we go to the routes.js file, routes.js. Some people say root. It says root. Oh, okay, cool. We're going to register this dun, da, 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 under slash, not slash sessions, because users don't know what sessions even means and they get freaked out easily. So we're going to just use slash sessions. And we're going to point it at our sessions routes, which obviously we'll need to include the file. So let's do sessions, too many S's, sessions. So you'll need this line and this line. So if you look at this, you can see how if you only had a singular routes file, how this would get pretty beefy after a while. Because you think about each one of these could potentially point to seven routes or more, right? So now we'd be at 28 routes. Our gshift application route file is, it's a lot of lines. It's almost 700 lines of routes because not only are our routes for these in there, our routes for API endpoints are in there. There's a lot of routes. Too much, way too many. It'd be nice to have them actually separated, but it's too much of a beast at this point. All right, so now that you have your sessions routes in there, if you jump back over to your page and refresh, you get the site cannot be reached. Let's go check our error, see why. I'm getting a route.post requires a callback function, but got object undefined. And the reason why I got that is because under our sessions JS, I said these two actions exist and these two actions haven't been defined yet. So why don't we go define those under our sessions controller so that we don't have that issue. So we'll do an exports.authenticate. We'll just leave them empty for a second. That'll take a request and response. Duplicate that guy and do a logout as well. Bless you. Good? Just a second. All right, jump over to Chrome. Give that page a good old refresh. Ta-da, we have a login page. If anybody wants to take the time and make that look prettier, I would be totally happy for that. Should be like more centered and maybe have like a little user icon above it or something. However, if you fill in these details, it's obviously not going to go anywhere whatsoever because we don't have a registered user, so it can't go anywhere. <clears throat> not to mention, we have no authentication yet. We need to build the authentication and we need to build the logout piece. All right, my little lecture. When the user submits the form, the request will be sent to Sessions Controller Authenticate, which we already know. Our first step is going to be to find the referenced user. All right, well, we can easily do that. 
we have the author model, right? That's where our authors are going to be. So finding the reference user just means going to the author model. And we have two pieces of information back from that login form. We have their email and their password. Right now, we don't want to verify the password. We don't care about the password yet. We need to just get the author. So we'll use the email to find the author. We've used this operation before. We've used find. Today, we're going to use find one. What find one does is exactly what it sounds like. It finds a singular document and returns it back. It takes one argument, and that argument is your filter. They call them filters. You can call them where clauses, essentially. So it's almost like the equivalence to select author from authors where email equals this email value limit one. That's essentially what we're writing here. So we're going to do author.find1. It takes an object. That object is literally what you want to filter by. It's the name of the attribute that you want to filter by and the value you want to filter it with. So we're doing email is the name of the attribute we want to filter by. And then it's request.body.email. I'm pretty sure. So that's coming from the form. As all queries we do with Mongo, they return a promise. So we get dot then and we get dot catch. And when I hit save, everything goes ba -da -da. If Mongo returns back an author, then we're ready to start the whole process of checking to make sure it exists. Otherwise, if Mongo returns an error, we're going to catch it. So we'll hold that blank for a second. We'll add our anonymous function. We'll give it author so it can store the author in an argument. And we'll give it a block because we're going to need it. We got lots of writing. Remember that really handy helper, the method helper we wrote back called authenticate? Well, that allows us to not have to write all that authentication logic in the controller where it doesn't belong because it's all data specific. Now, in order to use that, all we have to do is call author, the record that we had returned, and our helper method, authenticate. So it's author.authenticate, the thing we wrote. Authenticate takes two arguments. You'll remember it takes an argument to uh, of the plain password it needs to check against. So we'll get that from request.body.password. And the second argument it takes is a callback to which it's going to pass error and is matched to. If it's an error, I'm just going to throw the new error. And that will cause catch to pick it up, <clears throat> which then we'll send it out as a flash message and whatever. If there is no error, so if it's a match, if is match, and remember match is a boolean, right? So it's either true or false. If it's a match, I first want to take the user ID of the author and I'm going to add it to my sessions to store it. That is not necessarily the most securest way to do that because you're providing a piece of information that's kind of sensitive. The better way to do that would be to generate a token and add the token there and then use a destructor to be able to destruct the token back. Um, but we're doing this fairly simplistic. I'm just giving you kind of like a public service announcement. All right, request.session in order to access the session. And then this is just literally made up dot user ID, just a property I just created off the top of my head, equals author <clears throat> dot ID. So we're taking the author's ID record and we're storing it in request.session dot user ID. If that happens, we are happy. We are ready to redirect the user and let them know they are logged in. So request dot flash. 
success with two S's preferably success you are now logged in happy trails and then res dot redirect and I mean they're here to do blog stuff so let's send them off to blogs Our if condition should have an else statement because is matches a boolean. There is a potential chance for it to be false, for example, if their passwords don't match. So else, that will be request.flash error. And then error in big bold letters, your credentials do not match. Nice bag message. It should always be bag. Even if you can't find the author, you shouldn't send back, sorry, this email is not in our database. That's too specific. Always just say your credentials don't match. That doesn't mean that the email isn't in the system, and it doesn't mean that the password specifically doesn't match that email. You give them as little information as possible. Then we're going to redirect, slash login, and off we go. <clears throat> Next, we're going to catch our error. Request.flash, error. This is the one that takes the back ticks. Error. And then we're going to redirect. Res.redirect off to login with the error message. So we'll authenticate the user if they exist. I'm not actually 100% sure what's going to happen if they don't exist. We'll find out in a second because we'll give it a go. I'll scroll down a little bit so you can kind of see all that because it is a big block of logic. So now if you guys are building your own projects and you want to add, actually I think you have to add authentication but you don't want to call it author, just switch everywhere you see author to the word user and follow the cases and follow all that and you will now have users, right? Other than that, you're welcome to copy all that logic. It's totally okay. Don't feel like you're copywriting. However, I will award bonus points if you roll passport. Anytime you think outside the box. All right, anybody still typing this monstrosity out? No? We're good? All right, let's see how good we are. Let's jump over to Google Chrome. And we don't even need to type an email address because we're actually not validating email addresses. So we'll just do ASDF, ASDF. Hit submit, and we will get an error back. Cannot read property authenticated null. It's kind of a vague error. But my guess is our author, when we returned our author, was empty. It was undefined. So let's jump back. I mean, it's because we're trying to do this. It has returned something. It just has returned an empty thing. So we should handle that and actually deal with that right now. So I think if exclamation author, right, which basically says, is it undefined, false, null, whatever. And then we can just literally throw an error because the catch will catch it. And we will just call error your credentials do not match. Now I'm not sure if that will actually throw and the catch will catch it because I'm not 100% sure. If it doesn't, we'll just do the same kind of catch logic that we did before. <coughs> so 
See what I mean about being vague, right? I didn't find it by their email, but it is a bad thing to say, I could not find your email. It is much better not to give the potential brute force attacker any more information than required. Cool? Do you want to give her a test? Why not? Let's see. ASDF, ASDF, submit. Nice. Error, error, error. There's a lot of errors there. <laughs> Your credentials do not match. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's make them so they do match. So let's go to register. Let's register a new author, shall we? <clears throat> I'm going to create a new author named Steve. I'm going to attempt to spell Buscemi. Stevie at Georgian.com. Nice secure password of ASDF, ASDF. Like, obviously, those are things we should do, right? We should definitely be validating email addresses to make sure they're correct. We should be validating passwords to make sure they're strong and not just completely weak passwords. Oh, interesting note. <laughs> you know those forums you hit that tell you your password are weak, right? If, if you want to get past that, <laughs> shut off JavaScript, type in ASDF, ASDF, hit submit, and 90% of those forums will let it go through because it's completely client-side validation <laughs> only. All right, go ahead and hit submit. <clears throat> Yay, I'm registered, it says. So happy. What was my password again? Or my email? Stevie? How did I spell it? Oh, God. <laughs> All right. Glad you guys are paying attention. Georgian.com, ASDF. When I click submit, it should tell me I'm logged in. You are. And I'm now at blogs. Yeah, yes. But I mean, not that it matters. I can log out. <clears throat> oh, log out doesn't do anything. We haven't written that part. We should write that part so that this thing actually works. All right, let's jump back to our Visual Studio code. Move our cursors down to the session's controller and go to exports.logout. You will also be happy to know that we are almost done, so I will definitely have tons of time to help with any support issues. So in this one, we're going to go to request session dot user ID, and here's how we log them out equals null. <laughs> They're logged out now. That's <laughs> all it takes. They're logged out. Let's uh, send a flash message of success. You are now logged out. And then redirect them res.redirect and just take them home. Take them home. One thing that I noticed on Thursday that was catching people up, flash is done through the request object. Responses is where we're doing rendering and redirect. So be careful of not confusing those two. Once you're done that, go ahead and hit refresh on that page and then hit log out. Actually, if you hit refresh, you'll probably have to submit the form again, which will also log you out. All right. Everybody ready? Let's do it. I'm going to go back, refresh this page, log out. You are now logged out. But like I said, it doesn't matter. I still have access to secure content, right? And I need a way to make it so that I can't access secure content. So there's two ways that I should do this. Not only should I do it from a view perspective, but I should also do it from the controller's perspective. Does anybody know why it is important to do it in both places, not just one place? Right, exactly. Because I can take an application like Postman right, that doesn't even use the browser whatsoever. Or I can use curl for my terminal. 
and I can curl those locations. And I could send off post requests, I can send off get requests, I can do everything from curl or postman. So I need some way to stop that from the controller who's taking in those requests and stops them from actually being able to uh, get to us. Now, I could write authentication logic in each one of those things, but it would be much easier to have a helper, and I'm going to put the helper in the app because that makes sense, because it should be available to me upon every request that I have for my views and every request that I have for my controllers. So let's go to app.js. Yeah, I'll just keep saying you're logged out. We'll fix that in a second. All right, so underneath all the session stuff, right? Let's put it, uh, let's put it after views, actually. So after our view logic, just above our routes. We're going to write our authentication helper stuff utility things. I mean, you don't have to write all that, but. First, we're going to create a function. Const is authenticated equals, it's going to receive one argument called request. Bam. This is going to return a Boolean. Return request.session, so that says a session exists, and request.session.userID. Make sure you do ID with a capital I if you wrote it that way. If you wrote it in all lowercase letters, just make sure however you set the property is exactly how you write it in here. That operation is literally just going to return back the user's ID, actually. <laughs> It'll return back the user's ID. You'd think it would turn back a Boolean, but it's not. It's going to return back the user's ID. Doesn't matter. It's not false. That's all that matters because it will return false if it's false. I don't know why I find it so important to explain things to the exact of what they do. I should probably stop. I think I confused people. All right. App.use. We need to register this wonderful function. App.use takes a request res next anonymous function. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is we're going to register some wonderful properties. So request, we're going to give it a new function, is authenticated. It's going to be equal to this anonymous function call. If is authenticated, not is authenticated, with the request object. Then we're going to do a request.flash error. And you are not permitted to do this action. And then we're going to redirect them. Res.redirect. And we'll send them home. Off you go. So now inside our controller, all we ever have to do is call request is authenticated. That's it, just as a method. And when we do that, if they happen to not be permitted to do the action, it will auto take care of the error and it will auto take care of the redirect. So we'll just send them wherever they need to go, to home. It's always a good idea to send them to an unauthenticatable page, like a public page. Don't send them to an authenticated page. Otherwise, you'll wind up with a loop, right? It'll just keep doing the same thing, and you'll reach the redirect loop count. Once you have this wonderful function in place, we need a way to be able to do authentication checks in our views, which means we need to add to our locals, right? That's the only way we can do things is if they're on our locals. So what we'll do is we'll do response.locals, because every single request and response passes through all of these functions that we're registering, which is really handy. Is authenticated, 
is going to be equal to is authenticated request, whatever it returns. And then the most important part, because the request is passing through this, it will stop here unless we tell it, no, you need to go on. You need to go into the other registered modules and keep going through those. So we have to do next. And that will send it off to the rest of them. Once you have that, you should be able to go back to your browser. Go to blogs, and it should redirect you with an error message. Actually, it will not. <laughs> Never mind. All right, so anybody, is everybody done typing? Anybody still typing? Okay, let's go to, over to the sessions, or to the blogs controller and add in some of the pieces we need. On every single operation of the blogs controller, we need to add request is authenticated. So inside new, we're going to type in request dot is authenticated, and it's just a method call. Now, that's it. And what that will do is, if the request is not authenticated, it's going to send a flash message and redirect, because that's what we did in AppJS. You look very perplexed. Is my blog controller different than yours? That is potentially true because I had some serious Git issues today. Is it different than yours? What was my salty commit message? <laughs> I forget these things are public sometimes. <laughs> And yes, that is exactly it. All right. Literally, the first action on every single one of these controller actions will be that. So just copy and paste at the beginning on every single one of those. Paste. Paste. We could create a hook system that would allow us to do this check before these operations, but that would take some time and be rather in-depth. This is just as simple. Incidentally, another thing we could do is do a callback on our uh, routes and do it there. So at the beginning of the blogs route, we actually check this first before we go to the blogs routes, and then it would just handle itself. Otherwise, we would continue on to the blog routes. That's another option which I may convert that when we do the React stuff, just so it's simpler. All right. If you added that to everywhere, blog should be severely locked down. Yep. Can't permit. Not permitted. Still not permitted. Yep, can't do things. If you log in, log in, and then go to your blog stuff, you can now do all of your blog stuff. No issue. But logging out, no blog stuff. So now you'll notice there are still some issues. Like I can see blogs. If I'm not logged in, I shouldn't be able to see blogs. If I'm not logged in, I shouldn't see log out. Right, but if I'm logged in, I shouldn't be able to see register and log in because this is kind of a weird user experience. So let's go correct some of these issues. All of that is sitting under our main nav.pug. And like I said, we actually now have a helper called if is authenticated, and we can literally just wrap these things with that. So if you put your mouse, see this blogs thing, you'll notice that the li for it starts here. Okay, on about line 12, right after the about. Hit enter, put your line so it's in line with the li, and type in if is authenticated, 
that's our function call. And then take the li and all of the blog stuff and tab it in so it's nested into that if condition. I'm sure you can guess what that will do. Like I said, register and login should not show up if we're logged in. So we can do kind of the reverse of that. We can do if not, the exclamation mark, is authenticated, then login and register, make them children of that. And then last but not least, log out should only show up if we are currently logged in. So just above it, we will do if is authenticated. And we will tab those three lines in. Nice user experience. And don't worry, we're going to take care of that creepy looking logout button. <laughs> I didn't even write the CSS in here. <laughs> That's funny. For me, not for you. Not a problem. I'll fix it. All right. We good? Anybody not good? All good? Okay, cool. Jump over to... You're getting an error in the controller? Well, let's see if I get the same error. I'm not getting an error. I get cannot set headers. So one thing I did notice when I was doing this yesterday, I had to kill no daemon and then restart it because there was an issue with it maintaining the session and it was causing some errors because the session wasn't getting destroyed on each no daemon restart, which was kind of annoying. Now if I refresh, you should see register, login, and contact, but you shouldn't see log out. And if you're still getting an error, go cool, then it's likely a controller issue that you've got. It's likely a syntax error that you've got. Because um, I don't have any errors currently. Okay, so if you log in, submit it, you should be logged in, you should have no errors, everything should be good. Let's take care of that log out button because it's really weird looking. All right, so because it's a form button, we're going to need to go to our styles.css. And I think we called it destroy nav. You know what? I'm going to do myself a favor. I'm going to open a file that I have kicking around. Let's do projects, login project, assets, style sheets, styles. Do -do -do. And I'm just going to cheat and copy this stuff, and then I'll paste it into mine, and you will need this. So this stuff here is what you need. So the first one will actually reset the whole form, and then set the color to the correct color, and it will set the padding to the correct padding so it shows up properly in line with the other uh, menu options. The app media is so that when the menu gets condensed down to mobile size, that thing will actually appear the way it's supposed to appear. And then the nav destroy the last one is the hover event because it gets slightly darker when you hover over top. This thing? Yep. No, it's not. There you go. All right.
Okay, good? Yes? Anybody not good? Anybody still typing out CSS? Okay, I'll give you a second. We have one more major part. Um, I'm hoping we'll have time to do it. Okay, go ahead and save that, refresh your page, and the logout button now looks like all the other buttons, which is kind of nice. Okay, so this is cool, but we have a problem. Right now, I have no idea who wrote these blogs, because I can't see the author who wrote them, and I'd like to add the author to the actual blog post. The issue there is these blogs are delivered by the blog's controller. So the blog's controller knows who wrote these blogs, but nothing else does. If I want to create a blog for a specific author, I need some way to create an association between the blog and the author. And there's a few different ways we could do that, uh, but the way we're going to do it is we're basically, whenever a blog post is created, the author that is currently logged in will become the owner of that blog post. Okay, pretty straightforward. Whenever they want to view blogs that are theirs, they go to blogs, only their blogs will be listed. Which means if we do our stuff right, these three blogs should disappear. And we should not see them because they won't be that particular blog person, right? So. There's a few pieces we have to do in order to uh, do this. The first piece, I'm going to close all these windows off. The first piece is open models blog.js. And just after status, we're going to add a new field. And this will demonstrate the power of Mongo, the fact that we can change our schema at any point we want to without needing to log into the database and modify its architecture. We just do it right here, add a brand new attribute, no migrations, no weird schema files that we need to upload or rerun, nothing. We just literally do comma, the name of the new field, which we'll call it Arthur, author, not Arthur, author. Make it equal to an object, give it a type. The type is a bit weird because the type will actually be an object ID in order for us to create a reference. So it will be mongoose.schema.types.objectID. We're going to use an attribute we haven't used before called ref, which is a reference. Reference takes a string to the model that you want to reference, which will be called author. And then we're going to make this required. And that is it. You have now just created an association between blog posts and authors. That will maintain that relationship for us. And then Mongoose provides us cool, helpful methods that allow us to be able to make sure that the authors get included in the blog record when we send it back to the actual front end, which we'll add next. So in order to make sure that our blog posts are only available for the author that is currently logged in, we need to actually now start adding query filters to our queries under the blog's controller. So that way they're filtered down to only the logged in author and only the logged in author has access to these particular queries. Um, we also need to make sure that the author gets put into some of the blog posts and becomes available to them. And we can do that using something called populate. So if you open up your blogs controller, we'll start with uh, new. Does new have one? No. We need to start with index, actually. So we're going to start with index. So in index, the first thing we're going to do is in this find, we're actually going to give it an argument of an empty object. 
the object is going to have a key called author, which makes sense. And the way we're going to find the author is by passing in the request dot session dot user ID. So the user ID that we set. That will allow us to find the author quite easily. Now that what that will do is return back all the blog posts that that author is associated with. However, I also want to return back the author's record as well, so I can access their first name and last name and put them as the publisher for it. In order to do that, hit enter. We're going to chain on a query called populate, which is a query helper. Populate takes one argument. It can either be an object or a string. The string we're going to give it is author. And what that is going to do is it's going to take the author record and populate it directly into our blog post under the author key. So when we want to access first name, we access blog.author.firstname. Last name, blog.author.last name, which we'll see in a second. Now we also need to make sure, right now this is not going to work, if you actually jump over to your browser and hit refresh, you're going to see you're not permitted to do this action. So you'll need to log in again. Submit. You'll see that it's empty, completely empty. And the reason is, is because none of those blog posts are associated with that author, right? So we need a way to be able to create a new blog post, but that new blog post needs to be associated with that author. So we're going to need to update the other controller actions. So let's do show first, because show is pretty quick and easy. Show, we're going to change this find by ID to find one. And we're going to change the argument to an object with, uh, let's see here, underscore ID, like so. This is a bit annoying. And then author, which is the request.session.user ID, like so. So it's going to use both of those parameters in order to figure out who the author is. The first one will grab all blogs with that ID, which there's obviously only one because it's a unique identifier. And then the second one will only grab that particular blog if the user ID is also equal to that. That stops them from going, you know, blogs slash and some random ID that they just stole off the internet and hope to get the blog post when it doesn't belong to them. Now with the blogs for um, create, create is a little different. This is not in the same order for some weird reason. Create is fine the way it's structured. The only difference is, is we need to make sure the author gets added to the record. And the easiest, simplest way to do that is to take um, request.body.blog, right, that came from our, our form. Sorry, request.body.blog.author and make it equal to request.session.userid. And there we go. That's now a part of that particular thing. And then it will get written to the records, and that user will now become associated with the record. Very, very simplistic way to do it. Yes? Oh, it shouldn't be. It should definitely be uppercase. No, that is definitely a mistake. Yeah. User ID should always be user uppercase I and then D. Yeah. No, that was a mistake. Nice catch. Thanks. All right. So that's show, create. Drafts is not very difficult. Drafts is pretty easy. All we have to do is in the actual find method, we just need to make sure that it has the uh, author as the find. So just put your cursor in there, 
add a set of curly braces, <clears throat> and it's going to be author, and that will obviously be request.body.userID. Uh, And then we're going to do the exact same thing to draft or to uh, publish. So you can literally just copy that argument if you wanted to. What's that? Oh, no, it's not body. It's sessions. It's getting really late. Yeah, sessions. Starting to make stupid mistakes. In publish, you're going to have that same logic. I mean, not body sessions. There you go. And published. And this piece, in case you have forgotten, is your where clause, essentially. Right? So this will be find blogs where author is equal to the logged in author. Edit needs to be adjusted as well. And edit will be switched from find by ID to find one. It'll receive an object. This will be underscore ID colon, comma, and then the author. It'll be request.sessions.userID. Oh, I goofed. It's not sessions. It's session. Yeah. Everywhere you wrote sessions, change it to session. <laughs> That's it. I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> Long day. Yeah, this is so weird. I did it pr correctly in all the upper ones and not in this one. All right. <clears throat> Only two more to go. Just update and destroy, and then we're done. All right, you can see why people love scaffolding. It makes things so much simpler. OK, under the update, it's actually quite simple. Just put a comma after the request.body ID, add author in, and then it's request.session.user ID. And then the same with destroy. It's the exact same logic for destroy. Ooh. All right, I'm going to scroll down to destroy because it's literally the same logic. Comma author colon request dot session dot user ID, and that's it. That's all of them. All right. Let's jump over to the browser and let's create a new blog post, not post, post. So if we jump over to the browser, go to blogs, new blog. Not permitted to do this action, so you'll need to log in. Submit, blogs, new blog, title, my super awesome first blog, content. Whoa! There we go. Let's publish that because it's stellar. Hit submit. Ta-da! I got a published post. Now, I don't have an author's name here, and I want to put my author's name in here because I'm egotistical and I want to see my name. So we're going to add, plus I have no other reason to put the author in there. <laughs> so we're going to add the author. So jump back over to Visual Studio Code. I'm going to do you a super solid. If you're on Slack, this might be helpful to you. <clears throat> I'm going to copy the blog's controller for you. I'm going to create a new code snippet and paste that in there in case you got stuck. There you go. 
All right, the rest of you, open up uh, blogs index.pug. All right, above th actions, we're going to add th author. Okay, and then you'll see td equals blog.status. Underneath that, do td equals some nice back ticks, dirty back ticks. <clears throat> and we're going to use two string interpolation blocks in there. The first one is going to be the first name, the second one is going to be the last name. So it will be blog dot author to reference that record. Now you're into that document. Now you can access first name, and then we're going to do the same thing, blog.author.lastname. Remember that virtual property we created? We can actually create another virtual property called full name, and then we could do blog dot author dot full name and would pull back both names if we wanted to. We can add as many of those little virtual property helpers as, uh, that we want. Are we good? No? Yes? Maybe? Kind of? Kind of, sort of? I'm going to jump over to the browser and just hit refresh because I'm pretty sure mine worked. See? Steve Buscemi. It worked. <laughs> That's it. We have 20 plus, well, nobody's here after this. So as long as you need, if you're stuck or your thing is not working, I will help you with it until we get it working. Other than that, that's it for the night.